What's up, y'all? It's Dr. Paul. Today we got something fresh. Welcome to Liberty Hill Comics. I have over 40 years experience collecting comics, and the channel is where I share my experience and my passion with comic book collecting, investing, and conservation with you. Today what we're going to do is go over the process that I've developed for comic book conservation. This is something that I have developed over years. When I first started cleaning and pressing books, I'm a scientist, so I went to the literature. There's a whole rich peer-reviewed literature. It goes back hundreds of years on how to preserve paper documents and artifacts. And the paper conservation literature is rich, and it has a lot of information that, frankly, comic book cleaners and, and pressers generally know very little about. And so I started there. And I took processes that are well accepted there, and I modified them specifically for comic books, and through that developed the process that I'm going to share with you today. So this is top level. This is what I would call like a 10,000 foot view of the process. So let's get right into it. So these are the nine steps. I think in paper conservation, generally there are like seven steps that are well agreed upon. I added step four here, which is tape removal, because it's so often something we deal with, and it's not generally in the seven recognized steps for paper conservation. And then I also added reassembly and pressing, number eight here. And the reason why is because we almost, most, most of the time, we're going to remove the cover. We're going to maybe remove the centerfold. We're going to remove the staples, and we're going to have to reassemble those books and we might as well just recognize it in our process, right? And put it in the correct order with things. So basically, this is my nine steps developed from the seven steps that are generally recognized in the literature. And then the rest of the presentation will be breaking down each of those steps. So step one for me is preparation. And this is something that is super important. The old, you know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail aphorism rings true here. I always take a book before I start doing anything to it and I assess the overall condition. I take notes. I take pictures and we'll talk about that too. My step nine is documentation but actually step nine is happening throughout the whole process. I'm taking pictures, shooting video. So when I assess the condition I determine what I would do with the book if it was mine. So I determine which process steps are necessary. Not every book needs all nine steps. Some of the steps, some books just don't need. If there's no tape, you don't need tape removal, obviously, right? The other thing that I do is I want to communicate with the owner of the book. If it's not my book, I want to make sure we're on the same page and that the owner of the book has agreed to the steps that we're going to do in the process. The other really important thing here, and this is why planning and preparation is so important, is Many times with comic book conservation, we can combine two or more steps into one. Not only does this make it more efficient, but it makes it safer for the book. If we have an aqueous wash and an aqueous deacidification, can we do that in one step? Because the fewer times we have to take the paper from a dry state to a completely wet state, the better, right? So once we've sort of gone through all that preparation, we can plan out the work. I always do a written work plan for anything other than a really simple, you know, clean and press. There's always a written work plan. Again, if it's not my book, I'll have the owner of the book sign off on that work plan. The work starts with disinfection. For us, most of the time, that means mold mitigation. That is the main pest that we deal with in comic books. There are other forms of pests. Bookworms, for example, are larvae that literally eat paper and they eat little pathways through paper. That's why they're called bookworms. And there are other pests other than those. Silverfish are one that are relatively common. But for the most part, those are straightforward, don't occur that often. Mold mitigation is the main thing that we deal with. When you're dealing with mold, first thing you need to determine is it active mold or is it dormant? It, active mold looks kind of hairy and is wet actually and you can smear it. Active mold needs to be killed before it can be removed and also so that it doesn't spread further. Two compounds or I guess technically three here that we use 
calcium propionate, methyl and propyl parabens, those can be aqueous or in alcohol baths. These are the ways that we kill mold. And then typically we can physically remove mold spores or hyphae or bodies with the dry cleaning and wet cleaning process. There's often some chromogenic compounds left behind and we may be dealing with bleach to remove those, either chemical bleach or photo bleaching. So those are the main steps here for disinfection. The next step is dry cleaning. There's lots of videos on the uh, YouTube and uh, generally on the internet on dry cleaning. Typically though, it's worth mentioning, we start from the least invasive, go to the most invasive. So cotton rounds, Kleenex, Swifter, these are things that typically are not gonna interact with the paper much at all. And we're just trying to remove surface accumulation. And then we get into things that are a little bit potentially more invasive. Erasers, for the most part, are still just trying to interact with the, any contaminants on the paper, but they can damage paper fibers and gloss and sizing. So we take just a little bit more care. The three kinds of erasers we typically use are vinyl. These are like the white erasers. Kneaded, kneaded erasers are the ones that you probably, you know, the art kids in high school were, were the first time you saw these. They sort of look like silly putty. Um, kneaded erasers, for the record, are actually the ones that do the least amount of damage to the paper fibers. And so they may be where you start most of the time. And then gum erasers are kind of specialized, but we'll use them for certain things, certain contaminants on the comic book cover. So those are the three main erasers that we use. And then I list here separately Abzerine. Abzerine is a putty that is also used to remove surface contaminants um, in a dry cleaning fashion. And it's Abzerine, not Absorbine, because there isn't like a second B in it. All right. Tape removal, as I said, is, is a specific step that I added to the paper conservation process because we just deal with it so often. Tape consists of, actually, it's a complicated material, more complicated than it seems like at first glance. So typical tape is a carrier. So that's like the plastic layer, sometimes cloth, sometimes paper. That carrier is held to the paper by an adhesive. So if the surface of our work is here, there's an adhesive, there's the carrier. There's actually even a layer in between them called a primer. So to remove this from the paper, minimally you have to remove the carrier, you have to remove the adhesive. Sometimes adhesive is actually diffused down into the paper and we can, sometimes we can do something about that, sometimes we can't, but we may actually even wanna be trying to remove some elements of the adhesive from the paper. And so the reason I have the T's chart here on the left is because in order to do that, you need to know a bit about the tape and about the adhesive that you're dealing with. So some tapes, the adhesive is actually water soluble, in which case you would just use an aqueous bath potentially to remove the adhesive. And in other cases, that adhesive isn't really going to be soluble in water at all. And the T's chart is just a way to organize solvents based on how much polarity they have versus dispersion in terms of allowing solutes to go into solution. So we're typically dealing with solvents that can remove that adhesive. These are volatile, sometimes they're nasty. The other interesting thing about the T's chart is you can find a solvent that sits somewhere on the T's chart right next to another solvent. They're both going to uh, solubilize the adhesive in a similar fashion, but perhaps one of them is a lot less obnoxious. Maybe it gives off less fumes, maybe it's less toxic. So there's a lot of choices to be made with the solvents that we use, and that's why some knowledge of the T's chart is useful in this conversation. But we have to remove both the carrier and the adhesive from the paper before we really have successful tape removal. After tape removal, or sometimes in conjunction with it, as I mentioned before, sometimes we can combine steps, is wet cleaning. So as I mentioned before, with wet cleaning, first and foremost, you have solvents, and we can go to the T's chart to talk about solvents again. The simplest solvent is just water, and it's often the most effective. You know, water is known as the universal solvent for a reason. The other thing that we can add are surfactants. This is kind of a fancy word for soap, but we can add 
compounds in very small percentages that help solubilize dirt or other things that are in the paper that we want to get out of the paper. And so those are the two elements of wet cleaning. Combined with wet cleaning, we often do bleaching and we sometimes do some other processes as well. But I list photo bleaching here, even though it's technically not wet cleaning, because photo bleaching, although many people may think it was invented in the last year with blue LEDs, it's been around for half a millennia, at least. It's been reported in the literature for hundreds and hundreds of years. And typically it works best with a wetting of the substrate. And so I always do it that way. You've heard me call it in the videos, concurrent photo bleaching with a wet uh, clean or a wet process. And the reason why is because the action of the photo bleaching is made more efficient by the presence of the solvent, typically some kind of uh, aqueous solution. The other step that's often combined with the wet clean is what we would sort of generally call chemical stabilization. The biggest chemical stabilization that we do is deacidification. So paper by its very nature breaks down and creates acid that acid then accelerates the breakdown, which creates more acid, which further accelerates the breakdown, and you can get paper, paper kind of spiraling into destroying itself. So we often, just to preserve the book, want to get in there and do some kind of chemical stabilization. And again, the biggest, most important one is deacidification. The most used compound for this is calcium hydroxide. And there's a number of reasons. It's cheap. It's safe, it's easy to use, it's very effective, more effective than a lot of the more exotic chemical compounds that you could use, and it does have a very mild bleaching action as well. So you're going to see that as like my go-to deacidification wet cleaning solution. And one of the things that's worth mentioning here is that ideally we'd like to leave what we call an alkaline reserve in the paper. And what does that mean? That means we're not going to rinse out our deacidification solution. We're actually going to just put the solution in and then evaporate the water away, which leaves, a, leaves behind a chemical alkaline compound, which is going to stabilize the paper long term. And the way that's going to work is the next time the paper starts to break down, it create some acid. That acid is immediately neutralized by the alkaline reserve. And then that acid can't in turn accelerate the further degeneration of the paper. The other chemical stabilization that's worth mentioning is reduction with borohydrides. This is important because there's a couple of borohydride compounds where we can get a lot of bang for our buck because they work as bleaching agents, but they also strengthen the paper. Water itself will strengthen the paper if used properly. Some of the other compounds that folks use, hydrogen peroxide for example, chloramine T, these will actually weaken the paper. They actually break down the paper and make it less strong. Whereas the borohydrides will bleach and actually strengthen the paper by reducing chemical bonds in the paper. After chemical stabilization, we want to take care of what we call physical stabilization. Leaf casting is used to replace missing paper. So if we have paper where there's chunks that are missing either because they've been ripped out or they've just deteriorated beyond repair, we use leaf casting to replace the paper and that physically stabilizes what's left of the document. Mending is where most of the paper is there, but it's ripped apart or it's coming apart or falling apart, chipping apart, maybe it's a little bit brittle. And when we mend, we're taking what's there and we're putting a substrate over it to hold it together. Ideally, this is done wet, meaning if you have a whole cover of a book and you need to mend the upper right corner, you technically could just mend that upper right corner. But when you do, you've introduced water into the paper and that water is going to do things in terms of the paper is going to move differently, differentially when you dry it, and you're going to 
you're going to introduce wrinkles that are difficult to press out later. So you'll see me, and I talk about this a lot on my videos, I'm typically wetting the entire page, even if I just have a tiny quarter inch rip to mend. And that's not always true, it's not an absolute rule, but it is ideally done with the entire page wet. What is mending? It's basically taking what I mentioned before, a substrate, which is usually almost always some kind of Japanese paper, Tengujo is a popular one, and then gluing that in place with either wheat paste or methyl cellulose. Uh, wheat paste gives a stronger adhesion, but methyl cellulose is a little bit more inert, a little bit more stable long term. So if you can get away with less adhesion, the methyl cellulose is, is probably the preferred adhesive. If you need really strong adhesive power, the wheat paste is the way to go. Both of these are considered inert, although they're not technically 100% inert, and they can be reversed just with simple addition of water. The other thing with physical stabilization that we want to talk about is resizing. So what is sizing? Sizing is a coating put on paper to, it's usually with a fairly inert material. It's put on the paper for a number of reasons, but to strengthen it, to make it hydrophobic so that water will beat up on the surface. Comic books typically have the covers sized. If they're glossy, that gloss that you see is often sizing. And wet cleaning and other cleaning processes can remove that sizing. And in certain instances, we want to replace that sizing. So this would be this technical step where that happens. Again, we're often combining a lot of these steps from five through seven, but it is correctly positioned here with physical stabilization because that is what sizing is. Then we come to reassembly and pressing. So if we've disassembled the book, if we've taken the staples out, we could do a whole presentation just on staples. We might want to clean the staples. We may want to otherwise process the staples, de-rust them, do other things. We may be forming brand new staples, or we may be taking staples from a period correct book and adding them to the book because the staples from our book are rusted or otherwise broken or degenerated. We may have covered up the staple holes during some of our earlier processes. Maybe with mending, we covered up staple holes. So we're going to want to establish the location of the staple holes. We're going to want to place the staples correctly. We're going to want to refold the book correctly. And all of this is part of reassembly and pressing. And then, of course, we want a nice final press for a nice flat uh, book so that it presents really well. Pressing, again, there's lots of videos on the Internet about this and on YouTube specifically. The main variables to control are the humidity, that is, strictly speaking, the water content of the paper that you're pressing, the pressure that you use, the heat, the time, and what sort of layers you might use, what are called buffers in the pressing community. The most important being staple support, meaning something in the centerfold to support the paper on either side of the staples. Again, lots of other videos on this. I won't go into great detail here. But it's important to obviously reassemble the book correctly after all of your hard conservation work. And then I wrap up the work with completion of a documentation package. I always take written notes, as I mentioned. We want to have a record of what we did, and that way we can look back. If something didn't work out quite the way we thought, we don't have to go, well, how much, how much calcium hydroxide did I use? How much propionate was in there, what was the concentration? We don't have to worry about any of that. We have nice notes on exactly what we did. We have pictures throughout. And again, if you're doing work for others, or if you plan to eventually do work for others, you know, written notes and pictures can really go a long way toward making sure you're on the same page with the owner of the book and that your expectations meet their expectations. And that's the process. In summary, you want to plan ahead. That is the key to success with a conservation process for comic books. Not all comic books need every step. I mentioned that earlier, but you know, if there's no tape, skip step four, right? And you can combine several steps in one process many times. We can, we can actually use a concentration of um, an aqueous solution that does deacidification, washing, and resizing all in one. That's a really common thing to do. 
um, even cleaning, deacidification, mild bleaching, and resizing. That can be done in one aqueous step, right? So a lot of these things can be combined if we're smart about it. Not every book can you combine them. Sometimes you just need to deal with, with things serially in order. And then lastly, document your process. If you're interested in comic book conservation and you're going to start practicing, you're going to build your skill set and your tools, you want to document the process so that you can improve over time and we can all keep learning. So obviously I've got lots of videos on specific hyper detailed conservation process videos. Long hyper detailed might be good for some of you to watch if you have some insomnia and want to get some sleep. Check some of those out. See, you can see where they fall in this process. Now that I've formalized this process for you, as I do conservation comics in the future, I'll refer to this video and, and these steps specifically. If you need to purchase any of the materials for the comic book conservation process, please check the description because I do have Amazon affiliate links to all of the materials that I use. So if you want to use the same materials that I use, you can start off there. That way, if you have questions for me, I know exactly what you're using. And, uh, you know, I get a little bit of a kickback for that. I appreciate it. It helps the channel. I hope you enjoyed this video on the comic book conservation process and the steps that I have developed to the process over the years of studying the paper conservation literature and my experience in conserving comic books directly. And... Until next time, take care of one another.